we won't do it as well as John would. There is no way we can try to duplicate or replace the authority and passion that was in his work and came out of his work in his voice. You may have heard him. So we have a job to do that we can't quite match. We also can't supply the kind of off the cuff and zany humor that John supplied whenever he read. Uh, it was that way. But again, we'll do the best we can for this evening. It's uh, an honor to us to ask to do this, to be asked to do this, and we're very grateful to Dixie. Uh, I'm not, we have a list of readers. Uh, I'm not going to come up and introduce each reader. There are a good evening of readings. I will simply ask that each reader uh, comes up and introduces himself or herself, and we will go there from there. <coughs> Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, it is warm. When I think of Fresno, I think of John, who always teased me. I live on the coast in Santa Cruz, and uh, he always said it was too cold over there, um, one might argue. Uh, I want to thank Dixie for uh, asking me to participate tonight. met John in graduate school at UC Irvine back in 1974, I guess it was, three or four, and uh, I was looking forward to hearing John read for many of the reasons that Pete described. Uh, he was such a presence at the podium. And his, his last book, Angels at Bus Stops, is a real masterpiece. Um, we are at an age uh, where every time you finish a book, you wonder if it's going to be your last book. Um, if I had to finish with a book as good as Angels at Bus Stops, I'd be satisfied. Uh, but as uh, Beckett says in one of his plays, the day you die is like any other day, only shorter. <laughs> um, and so we have what is now John's last book. He was still working on it. I'm sure it would have been longer, but I'm thrilled to be able to read uh, a poem from Uncharted Stars, Last Poems, which has just been released and is for sale. This poem is, is very Weinbergian in its title, BLT, BLT with Avocado and a Bloody Mary. <laughs> it might be something I wish for when I'm dying, something more complete than the granite face of El Capitan, or more at peace than the chimed eyes of Tibetan monks calling out for their flock of hungry ghosts or more rooted than the panhandler caged in shadow in the corner parking lot off Wishon. I admit it, I almost lost my soul to deep fried chicken claws and deviled eggs. But when I bit into that crunchy bacon, thick slabs of foliaged fat carved from the underside of the moon's belly, my mouth turned into a grease splotched shouting sermon. I swined and sinned. Sherds of black soul took their redemptive places while the moored and trusty tenement of my tongue began to dream backwards. <laughs> the poetry gods must have been drunk on time and darkness when they watched Omar and I patching up our poems over a bowl of freshly pickled avocados. We would have them, pepper them with our words, and use the shells as ashtrays, then chant for the stray clouds to find their long lost verbs and the stars to toss their dice our way. 
we would bury the pits and hope that our wrangled phrases would pick up the scent of this valley's fern-rich loam, only return as the green and dazzling jewels of early April. To bite into a dew-covered tomato is to bite into a slice of sunrise, streaming its river of light into my cheeks. A young boy is sneaking out of his second floor apartment behind the potato chip factory. He is cracking a pocket full of walnuts against the curb as he follows an elbow of stars north toward the canal bank. Through a slaw of gopher snakes, brown Bermuda, and puncture vines, stopping only to adjust the red riders strapped across his shoulder and to yank out the stickers lodged in his bare feet. He hears the slosh of water and points his pen light into the scrub and stir of crickets. He finds the red eyes of squirrels and upstart tomatoes climbing and dwarfing the willows. He munches the tomatoes. They go down easier than the syrup of canned peaches nesting the cupboards of home. He notices how its blood matches the color of his gashed feet and how easily its juices accept his throat. I put my faith in heaven's oven to hold it all together. Thick skin of a marbled sourdough baguette, the fresh smell of pumpernickel seed gone to flesh has been known to steer many a sober scarred saint mad all washed down with the wild-haired bird of life's zesty pour of fire and ice rescued from hell's furnace. I'll glut the night and drink the day away, wait for heaven's harness to lift me up. It won't be a smooth ride, but it hasn't been a cakewalk down here either. <laughs> I'll watch the ships shrink into a shimmering horizon of uncharted stars. And for old time's sake, I'll lick my lips and once again taste the salt of poetry. Thank you. <laughs> Next up, Christopher Buckley. Gary, John, and I were graduate school at 74. And I came to teach in Fresno in 1980 and published John's uh, first book, a little letterpress chapbook called Nothing About the Dead. And um, with Dixie's help, we've just published his, his last book. Um, this has, I think, 11 of John's uncollected poems. But in addition, uh, it has offers a uh, biographical elegy, a wonderful interview he did with J.J. Hernandez at Fresno State, and a really nice letter he wrote to students at um, Reedley College with David Dominguez's uh, writing class. So there's quite a bit here of John um, in, the, in this small book. And we're here today to uh, celebrate uh, John's life and achievement as a poet. So I wanna touch on a few things. Uh, despite all the work that he did, uh, as a psychological consultant and for teens at risks. Um, he managed to publish five full-length books. He received two National Endowment for the Arts grants. His poems appeared in the Poetry in the Antioch Review and New England Review, Missouri Review, Plowshares, Quarterly West, Three Penny Sentence, and the American Journal of Poetry. His chapbook, Stickball Till Dawn, won the Soundpost Press National Contest in 1996. The Speed Limit of Clouds won CNR Press's first annual national contest in 2008, and the redoubtable um, independent poetry press Lynx House published his last full-length book, uh, Angels at Bus Stops. In addition to uh, two NEA grants, which are not easy to come by, John also received the Vern Rutsalo Award from Hubbub Magazine, had work selected for Poetry Daily, with our dear friend uh, Ernesto Trejo. He edited the important anthology, Piecework, 19 Fresno Poets in 1987. More recently, John and I edited together Messenger to the Stars, Luiso Marcelinas' New Selected Poems and Reader for the uh, Ash Tree Press series. I'm gonna read uh, one of the longer poems here that I was 
just really, really thrilled to see when Dixie uh, sent me the work that she found on John's desk and the computer. Because last October, John and I were driving around the Tower District. And for some reason, he mentioned uh, this term, uh, the non-privileged list, which is kind of like a high school detention list. And I said, that's wonderful. I said, you've got to write that poem. I said, all these things that it suggests literally about their high school experience, but everything else. And, he, and we started talking about things that might go in there. And then um, when Dixie sent the poem she found, there it was. Um, it, it's a poem that uh, demonstrates his great sense of uh, democracy his love of people, it shows his uh, compassion uh, and the beginnings of his skills as a psychological consultant. Um, I want to say thanks to Dixie for making this book possible. This is the non-privileged list. Um, oh, it has, it has a lot. Uh, he keeps going back to Henry Lopez here, which he told stories about for years. One of the kids he grew up with and uh, had a lot of stories about Henry. The non-privileged list. Whiter than snow in Sweden, duller than three-day-old dishwater, sour as curdled cream of wheat. I heard the Cholo boys clicking their zippos inside their khakis. A sound as symphonic as teeth clacking in an old man's sleep, or the sycamore branches breaking under the weight of an Indian summer breeze, scratching the windows of East Hall, where we all glared at each other. Wondering who brought the dice to roll for Johnny Mendes's last cigarette before they carted him out of English and into detention. Israel Gonzalez said, I had a white boy's hobo face because of my beady eyes and feral hair. Said I hopped trains to school every morning, which I did, just for the chase and the whiff of exhaust like burnt pretzels and the hypnotic grind of steel on undying steel sparking the day. He had a gold star tooth that glinted against the sun and a blade that gleaned specks of dried goo from his fingernails. His mother told him that Mexicans got their darkness from the moon. His father, a moth the light refused after he scalded his face with antifreeze under the flashlight of a wild and wispy moon. He drove a coppery primed fleet line with rust glazed Tijuana tuck and roll a fur-bordered mirror and slow gin in the glove compartment below a fake ID and ticket stubs from the Marigold Ballroom. After a sixer of Schlitz malt and swerving around sagebrush and the dusty cake corners of Kawa, we met Madrigal and Chewy at the park who glared me down with eyes blind as pearls behind the shades that I'm sure dreamt of boneyards in their sleep. The silence of the afternoon was broken by the hum of gnats, those electric eels of valley air, circling my ears, haloing my head. When they asked me to run for president of Roosevelt High because I was the only white guy who let them copy for my spelling test each week <laughs> and didn't snicker when their father staggered home from mopping floors in the graveyard at Zaki Farms and strangled the truth of their early morning whereabouts, I thought of Henry Lopez and how I locked him in the ball shed on a stuffy airless June afternoon, the scar in his lower chin striving to escape his face as, at thoughts of math. No one missed him until we all heard the banging and screaming. Henry never told me he was afraid of spiders in the dark and when added together, it was all the arithmetic he needed to know. Henry had been long gone to rumor and it wasn't the only time I'd been fired from a grammar school gig. Once before that, at, as a crossing guard, I got ratted out by six-year-olds for peeing in the bushes by the newly planted oleanders. My stop sign leaning against the lamppost of 7th and Kirchhoff. Not a year passes when fueled by bourbon and starlight, I don't think of Henry and his backyard strewn with hubcaps and refurbished bits of broken down Frigidaires and ask him to forgive me wherever he might be and for the moon to shine its spotlighted teeth into the necks of those kindergartners who pointed me out for pissing on their shrubs. 
I can't run for president because I'm on the non-privileged list for reasons I can't remember. I must have insulted the geometry teacher's mother, body slammed a stack of books in the library, or got caught trading nasties with a girl named Jaws in the third base dugout at lunch. <laughs> now I'm waiting for the first rain to come in pelts in the miracle of quiet, the rain washing away the sounds of childhood into the gutter, and for each of them to come out of the dark gaps between the clouds, put their hands one by one on my shoulder and say, it's all right, we had fun. And with the rain glistening my face, I will look each one in the eye and say, I'm sorry, I should have tried harder. Um, I want to thank Dixie uh, for asking me to participate in this, like Peter said it, it oh, sorry. Uh, I do want to thank Dixie uh, for asking me to be part of this. Um, and like Peter said, it's a, it's a real honor. Uh, I, I was actually a, a, a graduate of Roosevelt, too, and I think I was also on that list. Um, uh, when I was a junior at Roosevelt, um, I met a girl named Leah Hanslicek, uh, whose father was Chuck Hanslicek, who uh, was the professor at Fresno State, and the poetry community was sort of around. I started hanging around her uh, and following her around town, uh, and all of a sudden I was hanging around uh, all of these people who um, called themselves poets and shopped at Trader Joe's. <laughs> and, I had no idea what to think of it. And to be honest, I was a little suspicious. But um, some, it had a sort of a draw, obviously. Um, I often enough would find myself standing around this sort of um, edge of this group of people uh, at a poetry reading or, or, or whatever other function, um, not knowing what to do. And um, inevitably, John would come up to me and pull me aside um, and start to tell me some story um, as if we had known each other forever. Um, and not just that, but like as if our families had known each other forever. Um, and it would inevitably end with some ridiculous joke um, it would leave us both in tears. Um, but whenever I, I think of John, I think of that, um, what I would have to call a welcoming generosity. Um, and I think that same spirit is in his poems. Um, whenever I read them, I, I feel welcomed into them by the voice. Uh, and I feel like they have something enormous to offer me. Um, and I think that's equally true of the poem I'm about to read, um, which is called Jesus at the Ride and Shine. Um, and I emailed Dixie, because uh, you read this poem, and you can read Jesus as either Jesus or Jesus. And I, I emailed Dixie for guidance. And we agree that you could read it either way. And, and that's the problem with, you know, wonderful poems are these suggestive ambiguities. But unfortunately, I have to make a choice uh, since I'm going to read it out loud. So I'm going to read Jesus. Uh, but you should hear both. Uh, hear Jesus as well. It's so hot. Uh, this poem has a lot of driving in the heat, uh, which is what I did today. Uh, and... Um, this, I mean, the, the, the Jesus Jesus issue, um, I think another sort of quality of John's poetry is that they um, completely blur the line between the, the everyday and the transcendent. Um, they're brought together in these poems uh, in, in a way that hopefully allows us to see 
uh, that those things are not so far apart as they may seem. Jesus at the Ride and Shine. August, and the air is so still, you can hear flies stubbling the windshields and the snap of towels cracking a target of ants jacketing a floorboard of gum wrappers and watchtower pamphlets. Then the deep pause that measures the sun blessing the rough as rye tar of Blackstone Avenue floating from the eyes of Johnny, Nacho, and Troy, the sly dreamer, or whoever chips in for canned mackerel on discounted bread for lunch and an occasional game of 50 cent nine ball on Saturday after work. We knew it was him by the ruffled and blemished robe. Nothing a little miracle cleanser couldn't fix. The stray strap of sandal bitten off at its sole. The wind swept chaos of hair. And by the 3D postcards handed out to us by Grandma Solis on her Sunday visits to the hall. And the photos of him thumbtacked to the wall of everyone's kitchen nook of long ago, where he is the target of light, flanked mostly by old shits at a long, bulky table whose firebrand hands are hiding or complaining about the lack of meat for dinner. His eyes, then as now, as calm as Millerton Lake at twilight, as if they were folded into something lost beyond the horizon's ridge. A ship, perhaps, veiled by sagging clouds that outweigh the sky, and is confused by the green-finned falcon and debit cards only box as we are of analog clocks. So we play paper, rock, and scissors to see who among us will ride through the tunnel with Jesus? Through the antennae snap and hisses from below the stones of the conveyor belt and rollover blast, and the chemical wash of nozzles probing the tires, and the hot white foam of soap storming the windows until his eyes turn as gray as a nightmare of rotating scrubs and brushes, and I ask him to keep driving through the parking lot toward the southbound freeway until the dust chalk no longer claims our faces and I snip off the electronic monitor as we loll through the valley, white stars of cotton at our backs. And I teach Jesus how not to break on the curves until we hear the sea ringing in our ears children playing tag with the tide bums toasting onions on the makeshift grills and the goals ripping open another bag of doritos i could go on like this forever wind salt and seaweed drafting my nostrils bossing jesus to hold the wheel a little tighter a bowl of weed in the glove compartment of a shiny and towel dried car the mirror steamed with excitement and a hope grander than a gold stolen Cadillac. And in the distance, the air full of the shrill voiced solitude of seals. And with the valley heat at my back and Jesus's lantern blue eyes taking in the blue seas, my eternity's new playground roars. John was my stepdad, but I think more than anything, we were just really great friends. Can you hear me? Can you get closer? Yeah. 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 How's that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I've just been thinking a lot about him lately, and I think about, you know, the first time I ever met him, I think it was at 
uh, Chuck Knowlton's maybe. <laughs> and I was really, you know, being a brat like I normally was and bugging my mom. Are we going to go yet? Are we going to go? Are we going to go? And he looks up at me and he's like, what's your problem? <laughs> and I was just like, oh, you know, and it didn't, I don't know, didn't bug me. Didn't. I just liked him immediately. And I think that's probably how a lot of people felt when they first met him. And I just kind of knew, you know, when they were dating, when mom and him were dating, I just, felt like, oh, you know, I can let my guard down with him, you know, he just, he's a good guy, he's one of the good ones, so. The poem I'm going to read is called Emerald Sunday, and I think it's after a thrift store here in town, you know, the Emerald Thrift. Okay. Today could be the day when the Victrola dog barks and the cranky sewing machine awakens out of its coffin-flowered sleep to spin its music once again for the children napping after a Sunday lunch of fried gizzards and mashed beans. And as always, stoic as a century, the pearl-studded, lacquer-buffed, snake-carved cane has leaned opposite the register for over six weeks without a touch or glance not even from the arthritic pickpocket in need of a shave, as it waits to be returned to the man who hobbled off from a family reunion at Pine Flat, never to be found, or to be thumped against the curb, or to fend off the homeless, or to have its mahogany flesh scribbled with chihuahua teeth. The regulars called it Emerald Sunday. Green tagged items tagged at 50% off, and a free tube of sparkle for the after church crowd, <laughs> digging through their gardens of broken chains and cheap jewelry and stuff, scuffed bubblegum machines hidden among the tangled geometry of socks and the cataract lenses of snow globes and the mining of keen-eyed agates of rings and anniversary breaches, brooches. And who could remain unaddicted to the portrait of everyone's widowed aunt, designing angels that turn with the wind and with the sun, low enough now to shrink a heart and the sycamore branches high enough to clean the sky. We'll all walk home with our bags of whispering lamps and discounted resurrections, bobbing and weaving traffic in our two-toned, half-priced and airy, lighter than leaf spine made in Panama shoes. Okay, let's get this thing right to start with. Is that pretty good? Yeah. Okay. I'm Mike Cole. And first of all, another thank you to Dixie for letting me be part of John's night here at the river. I don't think there could ever be a better way of remembering and feeling the presence of a poet than to come together and share his or her poems. Since Dixie asked me to be part of this tribute to John, I've been thinking a lot about him and about what he and Dixie have meant to the Fresno community of poets and artists. In thinking about the kind of person John was, to me at least, the words tough, smart, and compassion came to mind. And all of those qualities blended with a strong dose of humor. And he had an especially low tolerance for bullshit. <laughs> Every time my paths, path crossed with John's, I remember feeling so comfortable and comforted by his presence. Hanging out with him in his and Dixie's lovely backyard on Brown, going out for a lesson in eating sushi with John and Dixie, in my visits with John in the last few years, he enjoyed chiding me uh, when I bemoaned the rigors of high school teaching and telling me how much he enjoyed substitute high school teaching after he retired from his mental health work, saying how easy teaching seemed. <laughs> and I imagine it was pretty mellow compared to John's very difficult night shift work in a facility for troubled youth. So much of our backgrounds was parallel too. Growing up in, in Fresno, graduating from Roosevelt High School a couple years apart, 
his telling me that he knew my older sister and my brother-in-law from his Roosevelt days and that he grew up in a neighborhood along Tulare Street not far from my childhood home on Iowa and Barton. So cool to know we were connected in those ways as well as through our mutual friends in the Fresno Poetry family. An example of John's compassion and loyalty was his long commitment to our friend Omar Salinas, no matter what struggles Omar was having, and they were many. I remember going with John and Chris Buckley to a breakfast John arranged with Omar out in Sanger, and in more recent years, comparing notes with John about our visits to Omar in the convalescent hospital where Omar passed away. How John sometimes gathered up Omar's oxygen bottle and wheelchair and took Omar out for a meal. That's the kind of friend John was. I'm especially pleased that Dixie chose John's remembrance of another mutual friend of ours, Chuck Moulton, for me to read tonight. I remember John telling me about sitting on his front porch with Chuck as Chuck held forth with his mind-bending stories and rapid-fire off-kilter aphorisms. And there is quite a bit of that in the poem I'm going to read. I think Chuck always knew he had a place to land and be listened to at John and Dixie's. So here's John's tribute to Chuck Moulton. Two Worlds for C.W. Moulton, 1936 to 1995. The Java Cafe has run out of espresso and Gloria has put off her last two therapy sessions. A line of Harleys outside a fruit stand below Pacheco Pass all backfire simultaneously and for the last time before their riders splinter off under sheets of exhaust, trusting the sore-shouldered valley wind to carry them. The sunflower root slips deeper into the muddied clay earth and the shedding sycamore strains to catch up to you. The dove hunters of Exeter have boxed their 22s for good and I want to stay up all night and wait for the moon to creep inside my skull and to feel the sudden shift of stars as you snarl and roll or pass them. I want, I want you to tell me again that my head is not a bowling ball and how you now dream the dream of cornerless rooms and how a hundred dark roses woke up, the sun drenched, woke up in the sun-drenched garden of your chin and how your teeth now dazzle with the sharpness that could crunch down a small planet in seconds. I want the morning to throw nails of light into my eyes so I can team up with the crippled boy at the bus stop, point you out of a crowd, hear the raspy elegance of your voice telling me not to listen too closely to the sad breeze that runs through abandoned barns or to willows on ditch banks covered with fly shit and lime, moaning in disbelief at how you can now growl through two worlds at once. I'm Samantha Canales, hello, and also dubbed Helen Keller by John on a particularly honorary afternoon. Um, Lance, who you heard earlier, is my husband, and we're friends of John and Dixie's. We spent many weekends together laughing and sharing stories, and got to hear impersonations of all of his poet friends. <laughs> So good that when I met them, I was like, oh, <laughs> it's you. <laughs> um, so I think it was at his memorial when his friend Chris said that John was one of the best poets of our time. And I don't, it, it struck me as true. It, I don't think that those were the words of a grieving friend. I think that was true. Read his work, listen to it tonight, and you'll see and hear, you know, how great he was as a poet and just in general as a human being. And thank you, Dixie, for asking me to read words for him in place, in his place, all of us here doing like what we can't really do, but we're trying. So 
Um, also, in the poem I'm reading is Addicts in the Afterlife. And we pulled up here today. I looked at this house and I thought, this could be the attic he's talking about. It fits. It's this old house. So you get a visual with the poem. <laughs> Loneliness is a wall the dead walk through when they're looking for company in my attic of vintage clothes and stacked oak chairs with hand carved knobs of lion heads and leather cushioned backs cat clawed by time. My uncle wears a hand painted tie of dice and clasped horseshoes dropping through a red sky. He shuffles cards to a murmur of clumsy laughter a jumble of light enters his veined hands, bounces off the floorboards and through a crack in the plaster of my ceiling. He wears a Belova watch that hasn't ticked since he was led to the afterlife and now tells time by measuring shadows. He is rubbing a shine back into his lost cufflinks when a flask drops from the secret pocket of his sport coat. And even though it is now always empty, everyone takes a pool, <coughs> clinks their motel stolen glasses to the starred hierarchy of angels they aspire to. They are speaking to each other as clouds must in the long drawn out <coughs> syllables of weather, a sighing vow for wind, a throat clearing cough <coughs> for thunder. They sort through a pile of yellowed newspapers that the rats have chewed into a nest to lactate their young. Miss <coughs> Weber refuses to drape her shoulders in her needle-pointed shawl because the rose has faded and smells like mothballs and menthol. My uncle lights another imaginary cigarette with his invisible lighter and blows out smoke as if it were a miracle. They read their obituaries to find out what the weather was like the day they died and are disappointed so little was written about them. How Miss Fry drove her grandson to rehab until he got cured of the shakes or Miss Thomas re-shingled her house by herself in the deadening August heat or anything about Mr. Granz's death march through the Philippines. Nothing about Mr. Eagle's heirloom tomatoes. When I open the door, I am met by a circle of dusty coats and moldy dresses and the necks of hangers where their faces should be, as if waiting for someone who just got here to open their eyes. Good evening. Uh, my name's Victor Trejo. Um, John was a very good friend of my father, the poet Ernesto Trejo. Um, and so I met John uh, a long time ago when I was, you know, uh, much younger. And um, uh, I met a lot of different poets uh, growing up, but John was always um, just such a nice person. And I felt, uh, I, I think I was very fortunate to meet him again as an adult. Uh, I started substitute teaching. And so I would run into him every once in a while uh, at different schools. And he would uh, usually stay in the class because he didn't want to have to deal with all these other kids and everything. So I'd have to go find him like at lunch. And I'd say, oh, hey, John, how's it going? And he'd be, oh, hello. And we'd talk for a little bit. And then I had to run and get food. Um, and then I'd wait for him after class if I was lucky to be working at the same school. And, uh, you know, we'd talk and uh, walk into his car for a bit, and uh, it was just a, a really nice, it was just, uh, it was just very nice to reconnect with someone who was, who had not changed since I had been a child. Um, this particular poem, uh, The Rain's Burden, was a poem that he wrote uh, for my father after my father passed away. <clears throat> the Rain's Burden. 
Tell me, dear friend, where can I reach you now when I rise each morning craving light to go watch the last shirt tail of stars pale above the rooftops? The trash cans are piled and the dogs persist in snoring much too safely. The fortune telling lady wakes up in a sweat, shuffles to her wardrobe, cracking her knuckles, and that blue loop of clouds we once laughed at is the only bed I have left to dream on with my eyes wide open. Yesterday, I drew your face among them, between the lion's mane and the dove's eye, and bargained off each part of my body if you would come back and sit beside me until I, too, became bodiless and part of a wind strong enough to have the eucalyptus tree carry off its roots and summon the rain to fill in the empty crater. From the chicken pie shop window, I thought I saw you standing beneath the arc of a lone pistachio leaf as it tumbled gracefully to the sidewalk. It was when the air smelled of cinnamon and burnt potatoes. It was when that old couple finally zigzagged the traffic across Olive Avenue, bent over as if they were carrying all their summers on their backs and the hot pavement had already hardened the feet of your children. It was when those old men filed into their familiar booths and exchanged clues of autumn, and when that woman who reads romance novels before coffee was a little late for work, I thought how unfair it is that you can watch me growing thinner and clawing at myself from the inside out while I go looking for signs of you only dreams can send. For nine days, I circled your house. The marigolds writhed in the sun. The, the, the field mice perished in shadow. The grass yellowed and time smoldered, and when you did not come out, I knew the first rain would have to fall in pellets to soften this chalked over valley, and death would quit measuring us. Then I'll go bare my feet to the gutter, watch the rain lap the ruts, water my blood, shrink the clouds so I'll once again hear your voice, clean as a harp, in the hiss of the palm frond, in the rifle of the sparrow's feather, in the roused eyes of children at play, in the words that rise out of a sunset of leaves glistening just beyond the tree line. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am John and Dixie's granddaughter, Heather. And as a child, I have memories of them pulling out an old recorder. I don't know if you remember that. And you would have me read poetry. And even my little squeaky kid voice, he was always so encouraging and helping me with everything. And that's just what he was like as a grandfather. So on that note, this is an elephant plans its escape from the circus. I've always dreamt big and thought small. Tomorrow I'll flap my ears to the first murmur of wind that'll leak from the sculpted banana leaf and the raisin bush that bends its blossom head west to a desert I remember, stumbling across as a calf, holding on tight to my mother's tail, as my aunts and sisters and cousins nudge me forward, through bush willow and star grass, away from the shrieks I was too young to take in, until I collapsed like a tent in high wind and have been wandering where they now went ever since. Say adios to whips and tricks of my friend the juggler, as he patted my head in one last act of revelry, Tossing balls that had been double dipped in the sunset to a fabric of blue sky, now pockmarked moons, as far as my eye could wander. Tomorrow I'll fly the bamboo guarded moat, stretch a stalk or two to my own liking, past the squabbling squirrels. I'll learn from the yellow headed, gluttonous gannet how to dive from an immeasurable cliff with a bubble wrapped face uglier than my own, and pull out a smorgie of sardines and not leave a ripple. I'll land with a thud louder than a plane crash, clouds blacking the high rises and roll my body around in dusty circles of happiness, crunching cars as effortlessly as groundskeepers crush a chase of burnt leaves. Adios to catching peanuts while balanced like a chihuahua on a stool and picking up dimes with my trunk. I know how hard it's going to be getting lost in someone's backyard, lumbering into their pool, being the gray and acorned eye of gladness staring into a kitchen window beyond the wind whirling curtain, shouldering the depleting shade, wishing to fit into the cricket's throat, the lizard's lung, the crevice to roam heaven, from a pause and level with the earth's rumble as guide. Tomorrow I'm going home.
I'm Chuck Hanslicek. Early on in my friendship with John, I had a pool table at my house and we used to shoot pool once a week. And we played straight pool, which is a long game, 125 points. And the games got fiercely competitive. And once when I won, John accused me of bamboozlement. <laughs> At the time, he was working at Kingsview Mental Hospital in Reedley, and he talked a lot about his job. And it, I think it was the job that made the best use of his skills in his working life. He was, uh, Kingsview was a huge operation with two on-site psychiatrists and medical doctors and nurses and a well-trained staff. And John was a terrific listener, but he also knew the right thing to say at the right time. And he would tell stories about the patient sometimes that were funny, but never at the expense of the patient. They were just funny in the way that life is funny. And then life got unfunny when insurance companies started limiting the amount they would pay for mental health care and eventually Kingsview closed, and John was out of the job of a lifetime. The poem I'm going to read is when Salvador Dali camped on my roof. <laughs> it was a good year for figs and a summer of honey-melting heat when my neighbors saw him shackling himself to my chimney, braiding twine to rope the clouds, a band of jays shit on his cape, and not by accident stray cats serenaded him from the bushes. Let's get it right. TV antennas were spider webs designed originally as modern crucifixes. Skateboards were wheelchairs pumped up on amphetamines. Cars were elephants craving water. All palm trees were phalluses. And from where he sat then, the stars were butterflies that crisscrossed the sky and collided for his pleasure only. And through the night light of my neighbor's house, a mattress sagged under the weight of excessive loneliness. We dusted off our lawn chairs, hugged our children, short-leashed our dogs to watch him raving at the moon until my roof became heaven's nightclub. We hosed the roof to cool him down and watched the heat rise from shingle to shingle in cushions of mist. We tried to talk him down. We named our community garden after him and had him sample the tomatoes. We tossed him an alarm clock so he could predict earthquakes and laddered up to, to him a Bible a day so he could continue to declare war on death. One morning we found him dead among the hydrangeas, flattening the crabgrass, a shadow of flies already feasting. We closed his eyes, but the lids kept popping open, his face a hodgepodge of crumpled maps. Tracy Lane, so as you probably well know, I'm uh, John's uh, stepson. Uh, John, he was truly the best uh, person I could go to for advice. So uh, he was truly missed. Um, I feel like uh, I had a, I heard about this event. It's like, wow, the long, prolonged tribute to John. I mean, <laughs> you know, because it's not easy. <laughs> and, uh, but that's good. I'm glad I came out of here. 
this is a good I think it's a very good uh, chapter towards uh, the end of the closing I guess that we have to do that I'll have to make with, uh, with John so uh, it was not a day as I read this this is a um, the Bone Chewer. Many of you may have heard this one. There's not a day I don't pick up sausages at Fresno State. Right home on a bike, and I think, where's John to share these sausages with? <laughs> I don't think that feeling will ever go away. So uh, here it is, the Bone Chewer. One day his teeth will go off with a clang, and the lard that turned cold in his beard will soften, seep down and inward, to encircle and suffocate his heart. To him there's nothing more beautiful than facing a blank wall, a citadel of bones within reach, cartridge of pig knuckle, muscle of deer thigh marinated in broth, to hear the snap of chicken breast between his molars is hearsay, and to dip his tongue into the elk morrow is a probe of the clouded eye of his father. When he fingers the delicate pheasant wing, he is reminded of the frail legs of his aunt on her deathbed, whose legs would spasm and pulley up to her chin in quick motion. He still expects her any day now to jerk out of her death. To take vengeance on a quart of mutton is to ensure himself the next life. He won't go hungry. And when he's done, mingling the rabbit, staggers towards you with his greased anointed chin, bumps your wine and collapses at your table, face swelled and his neck sizzling like a racked lamb. <coughs> Don't think you can do anything to save him because after all, you just watched him eat a crate of raw chicken bones whole. <laughs> and there's not much you can do to help a man like that. A man who met his match and a sheave of gristle from a cow's butt. And now holding that weight over a dozen dove ribs in his throat, his breath clogged, a temple of chipped bones bubbling in his wake, a man who never tired of eating and dreaming and who desires remembered as one who made many a good dog sad. <laughs> I'm Jill Lane. That was my husband. So I married into this lovely family. So John was technically my stepfather-in-law. He was a friend. And when I was doing my master's degree, part of my um, requirements was to do a project. And so I had the honor of taking John to the internet. And with a lot of help from my husband, we put together John's website. And when I asked him what poems he wanted to include, the poem I'm going to read to you was one that he requested to be on there. And it's called Butterflies. I'm writing a letter to the president as makeup for an assignment I flunked in the fourth grade. All immigrants should do so, said the teacher. Even though I got here by ship, I don't remember anyone ever weeping at the sight of the Statue of Liberty. We were cold and nauseous. But I do remember each of the 23 faces that crammed the breezeway of the apartment building when the civil defense sirens went off. It wasn't that the mills of morality stopped grinding or that I spent too much time eavesdropping on the after hours anarchists raging at the shoeshine parlor, or that each day Susan Monge dared me to peek up her flower print skirt and caused me to fail my assignment. I didn't know how to use periods. My rule was that you used one after each breath. So I had a lot of one-word sentences. And if there were a lot of breaths with no words, the whole page would quickly fill with dots. Sometimes when the words outsprinted the counting of breaths, I would place periods in random spots hoping God would overrule the rules of punctuation. 
I will write a poem for the president that imitates my childhood. A sonnet on Mother Earth will do wonders, except that we abandoned her a long time ago. I'll write how I learned baseball in an alley in Pittsburgh, my cousin whittling a bat out of a two by four yanked from a shed behind the hospital. I've never seen a true cowboy and I'm afraid of horses because they hate us. We whip them and have them stand in stalls for most of the day. So far, my lessons in history have been in remembering wars that my real life is trying to forget. Because the president is a hard ass who spits on his hands before answering the phone and I'm out of a job, I'll start the letter in spring and end it in early winter. I'll drive to the mountains, the coast, trample the slough weeds of my valley, collecting butterflies, monarchs, reds, and lilac bordered coppers, and the erratic hackberry emperor. I'll burn one wing off each and mail the rest off, tendril body and all, to the president. Butterflies are supposed to carry messages from the dead. Souls are ringing. My name is Peter Everwhite, and uh, I'm going to read a poem of John's called uh, The Owl Express. But I want to tell you a brief anecdote about this poem. Uh, Chuck Hanselcheck and John and I were accustomed to meet weekly and have lunch together. And one particular uh, lunch, I had seen a a literary magazine uh, announcing that John had won a very substantial prize for this poem that I'm going to read. And he had won it weeks and months previously to our meeting for this lunch. So I asked John at that point, John, why didn't you tell us? We would have bought you an extra Bloody Mary or uh, sang a drinking song to you or something. And John, he didn't do that. Uh, John simply waved it off and changed the subject immediately. And I tell it because it's an example of the kind of rare thing that you find in people, uh, a sense of, of really true humility, not false, true humility. And it is especially rare in literary people. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he had no sense of that self-promotion and that pomposity, that, uh, that self-absorption. Uh, and, and by now, John would have felt here uh, probably embarrassed to hear all these nice things about him. Uh, so I will, I, will, I will point out a place where he might have had a touch of vanity uh, or pride. Just a touch, but a touch. The question I should have asked him would go something like this. John, can you tell me the 10 worst restaurants in Fresno where I could order organ meats and run little risk of coming down with Tomain? And John, his eyes began to sparkle, his mouth began to water. Uh, he looked alert and he said, sure. He named off 10 by name, by the name of the owner, by the waitresses, by the location. And he looked very, very self-pleased. <laughs> 
So I want that note. Uh, I should add one more point to what I'm going to read. Uh, Connie Lake, who was supposed to read uh, this evening, uh, was unwell. Uh, she honored and loved John. And she asked if she could add her voice to mine when I read this poem. So I read for both of us. The Owl Express. Our fingers are padded with soot and our hats don't fit. We breathe the same air the flies have already choked on. And if you are brave enough to sit with us at the back of the bus, our glares would crumble you to the challenge of a fight or the look of one whose face has been chipped out of ice or had one too many shock treatments. We've all been given passes, carry crazy weed in one pocket, swipe sugar packets in the other, which we divvy up as if it were as valuable as the silver compass or a spray of stars hiding in the brick shadows of Fulton Street. Beads of sweat dribble down our necks and into our shabby collars, the spine shivering soon to follow. At night, we want to be left alone to bump and glide around by the town in circles, because after all, we're afraid of the unending horizons of the dark and of becoming bats, a life we all came close to wanting. Zeke wants to be a penguin and live in an igloo by the sea, his puffed out chest sliding across the ice and never copping the chill. Ernie strums his imaginary guitar, and it's all understood that no one mutters a word about death when we're almost there, and still no one to invite us in. The measure and secret of music are how many devils it can chase away with its passed down notes, says the fiddle playing angel our mysterious brother, scraping the stars for a song, gallivanting from one bus stop to another, always ahead of us, riding, raiding the unlit doorways and bare bones banks, the peeled shutters of all night cafes. Fire and grace, to the woman saying goodbye to her sick cat. A bouncy jig for the limping street walker. A raspy reel for the dog leashed to a parking meter. A spicy slide for Carmen, who's sure to come back as a seal. Cracking crab and bouncing on the ocean's shoulder all day. And let's not forget those crisp swings for those reading their rented fairy tales in the haunted corners of underground parking lots. Those in the windless stop at Courthouse Park among the den of bus shelters and the blossoming nests of tents when the sun begins its long walk up the stairs of the sky and heaven starts to shed its skin of darkness, the attendants wait to take the angel away. They let him fiddle his way to the unknown in handcuffs that glint like glowworms 
banded around his wrist. He fiddles a song no one knows, whistling for more light, and it always comes. Can you hear me okay? Um, I definitely want to thank the Parkway and Megan and all the people who work really hard to put this together. It's a wonderful, wonderful event. And I'm very grateful that we were able to put on this tribute for John. I, I worked, my main goal in this whole process was to try to create what I thought John would have done or what he would have wanted. I couldn't possibly recreate what he would have done. But I'm very grateful to all the readers who read tonight and for all of you for coming out and bearing with this heat. And, and, and uh, I know it's going on for a long time. I'll try to make my comments short. Um, I think the key to John, all of John's poetry is imagination. He had the strongest, the most incredible imagination of anybody I've ever known. And he could just take anything and I mean, the small, the uh, most mundane event, um, object, anything, and extrapolate it into amazing, go to amazing places with it. And um, I miss that. I miss his support. I miss all so much about him. But I, more than anything, I miss his humor and the fun that we had. I mean, we had 30 years of just plain old fun <laughs> most of the time. We always had fun together. And um, I'm going to tell you a, a short, uh, uh, in that regard, I'm going to tell you about a dream I had not too long ago. Um, John did this thing he called his magic tricks. I don't know if anybody got to see those, but he did. it was a bit that he did where he, they were fake magic tricks, of course. He didn't <laughs> do real magic. He just pretended to do magic tricks. And he had, a, he had a very convincing way of presenting this. And you know we would all be howling with laughter at these, at these fake magic tricks of his. And um, um, so I had this dream the other night that um, John and I were on a cruise ship. And Frank Sinatra was there. And we were walking around the cruise ship together, Frank and John and I. <laughs> and uh, I turned to Frank Sinatra and I said, did you know John did magic tricks? And he said, no. And I said, would you like to see his magic tricks? And he said, oh, I would love to. <laughs> and I said, OK. So John did his magic tricks for Frank Sinatra. And I'm worrying the whole time, oh my gosh, what have I done here? <laughs> this is, they're really goofy little tricks, you know. But Frank Sinatra loved them. He loved John's <laughs> magic tricks. And I don't know, it's just kind of, uh, I, I, w I just wish so much I could share that, that dream with John. He would have loved that. I'm going to read the Angels with bus stop, at Bus Stops poem. It's the signature poem in the book. And uh, I just have to tell you real quickly, there's a story that goes with it. John's sister over here is, I asked her before the reading to refresh my memory. Uh, all I, and I'm st still not sure I got the story right. But um, there's an Estonian man that she took piano lessons from, and he was over, overheard at a bus, bus stop, a woman talking, he was a speaking in Estonian, and, he, and a woman overheard him speaking Estonian, and then this led to uh, John's mother being, bring, coming from Pittsburgh to Fresno to get a job because of this uh, um, completely unremarkable uh, connection between, uh, you know, just happened to hearing this woman speak Estonian, or this man speak Estonian. So, there was a lot of coincidences like that that happened. I'm not going to go into any more of them, but we had a lot in our own story that brought John and I together. Um, so I think coincidence is a big part of this poem, or not coincidence so much as just um, how, thing, how the oddness of way, the way things happen sometimes. And I think the angels at bus stops can be read two ways. There are real angels in the poems. And this book is full of angels. 
that come into it in various different ways. And the angels at bus stops, there is one angel that he's referring to, which is the woman who made the connection for them to, uh, his mother to, to um, come to Fresno and get a job as a nurse when she wasn't able to uh, get work at first. When rain is the scratch of fingernails across the moon's face and the wind sears the treetops, stapling its eyes shut, the angels have a tough time telling time or in what direction they're supposed to be transporting the dead. I've watched them limp into boxcars, brimming with sacks of dirt-crusted potatoes, ready to lift a supine hungover and mistaken saint into the smoke-stacked air of South Fresno. And once you thought Marty the wino was buried alive under a cardboard coffin. Rain tilts my umbrella toward a lost afternoon of darkened windows in coffee shops and flooded canals. It's weed tangled bottom shimmering with silver handguns perceived by the angels to be the jeweled perch of Jesus. When they come up behind me, I don't know if I'm dead or alive. They shrug their wings as if to say, taking care of the dead is harder than you think. Even the padlocked taco trucks and check cashing parlors on South Van Ness look worn out, their windows veiled in soot, each starless time the train whistle pulses through, their souls sawed into streamers with a dull blade of money. In the bone-chilling emptiness of November, a woman in a black hat and overcoat is fumbling for change at the leafless bus stop on First Street. Her husband with his rooster-crowned hair mumbles to the unpeopled sidewalk in his native Estonian that the chimes of winter have just begun their steady climb to a tumultuous crescendo. Bus stop angel who walks me from cover to cover through rain and bad dreams. How often you remind me that I got here by the message you sent from that bus stop to Pittsburgh to my mother to reunite her to her refugee friends and a job. I have followed you since then through the cold and deepening puddles toward any tunnel you choose, breathing in the mist, it breathing in the mist of your wings, the shoulders of heaven hidden behind the soggy clouds and dark grill of the sky. Thanks everyone so much for being such a wonderful audience. And the books are for sale over there. Um, Bus, there's three books for sale tonight, and then there's also the um, the anthology, or not the anthology, but the, the book that Chris mentioned that's, I think, $5, Chris, is that what it is? It's the newest book with um, the unpublished poems in it. Thank you.